series of lectures which will focus on prehistory of diplomacy or uh, diplomacy in a, a prehistorical society all over the world. We will uh, today divide the session in two parts. Introduction to the series of webinars which will focus on evolution of diplomacy and technology. And second part, uh, focusing mainly on diplomacy in the prehistoric uh, time. Let us start with the introduction. The underlying spirit of our series of webinars will be interplay between historical developments, history of technology and diplomacy, and our current time. We will try to see what we can borrow from the history and what we can learn from the history. We, we will see later on in a few minutes that one has to be careful when it comes to historical analogies. But this is the main spirit of our webinar, what our internet-driven time can borrow and can learn from the historical experience related to evolution of diplomacy and technology and society in general. We are inspired by famous uh, Churchill uh, saying that uh, uh, further backward, you can look the further forward, you can see, I can note in spelling mistake here. That's the point. Uh, uh, some historical lessons can be learned from the very, very beginning of human society, and they are as relevant uh, today as they were when uh, they were happening. Now, the key point in our discussion is to revisit the famous saying, the Latin saying, historia es magistra vite. Um, history is a um, teacher, life teacher. And the question of what uh, uh, we can learn uh, or uh, what can we uh, learn from the history. Uh, the other question is uh, along these lines, are historical events unique? And probably the answer could be found in the reflections that when we speak about history, we usually reflect our time and our dilemmas. Therefore, speaking about history is also speaking about the, our time, uh, present time, and future, future time. We are immersed into the language that we use today. We, we use the certain philosophical categories, way of framing the issues and the problems. Therefore, the unique interplay where we can gain something from understanding history is in this uh, uh, interrelated view between past and present. Therefore, we will be reflecting what are our priorities today on what we would like to think about the future while also reflecting on the, on the past. And this, this will be underlying, I would say, philosophy of our uh, webinars. And one of the key questions here is, are historical events unique? Well, they are unique and that's, that's completely clear, but there are still some tendencies and some elements uh, which are common across the time. And we can see, for example, I can give you the, the simple example. We know more or less that 40% of participants who register for our webinars uh, join the webinars. Therefore, 60% for some reason do not uh, show up. And it's very strange since even registration takes some energy and time. And I don't know why they type their names. We can, with a quite uh, uh, clear paternity, identify this trend. But we cannot say if, for example, Hannah or Ginger or T or Mattia or Mikhail or Mina will appear at the webinar. This is the same thing as with the history. We can, with a quite certainty or probability, identify the trends, but we cannot exactly predict where the revolution will happen or when the charismatic historical leader will emerge on the historical scene, like Napoleon, Julius Caesar, and other players. This is important to keep in mind, and we will be playing between this dichotomy between identifying probabilities and trends and, uh, and uh, analyzing the role of historians, uh, historical figures in the past. I'm personally a, a main follower among the, of the Fernand Brodel, historian, uh, French uh, historian, among the many historical schools trying to identify this question of paternity in history. I uh, subscribe to his views, and he has the three level of understanding history. He has the, um, what he calls long durée, the history of the long uh, uh, swathes, and he, they call it also geological history, the history influenced by 
geography, the influence by terrain, climate, and other issues, explaining why certain developments happened in, for example, tropical area, why uh, uh, industrial society, for example, developed faster in the colder northern areas. The, this is the first layer, and it is now counted in thousands of years, the very, with very, very uh, slow uh, geolog geological changes of shifts of continents, the emergence of uh, lakes and uh, mountains, the changes in climate. All the climate changes is now accelerating. On the second layer, we have uh, changes in the Brodel's methodology, which are happening in about 100 years, therefore maybe three to four, like three to four generations. Those are mainly ideological and economic changes, cycles in uh, society. This is what we call today modern history, what's happened over the last 100 years. In, uh, the First World War, uh, the capitalism, socialism, the end of socialism, the main ideological changes, economic changes, industrial revolution. This is that. And then on the top, he has the uh, so-called uh, uh, immediate history, history of uh, what is happening now. He uh, made an analogy with the waves of the sea. They disappear very quickly. And here he places the individuals. And the famous question, if the Cleopatra's knows uh, decided the history of the um, uh, Roman Empire, well, knows apparently, was very attractive and it attracted uh, Marco Aureli and uh, uh, quite a few uh, at that time leaders of the Roman Empire. And the question is, was it just uh, her nose or geostrategical reason, motivations uh, of uh, Roman Empire to capture the Egypt? Therefore, uh, uh, Brodel is basically analyzing history in this three levels. Geological level, mainly geography, climate, the level of the main trend with the duration of about 100 years, and then that wave uh, e event trend. Now, unfortunately, due to the media trend these days, we are mainly focusing on this top layer, and we are focusing on, on, on our time. Now, here is another C uh, metaphor, which you can see uh, that, uh, we, and a few caveats, first caveat, is that we should use historical analogies with great care. In a few minutes, we will reflect on the start of the First World War, an important event which is now uh, in the focus on media. And it's good that media is now reflecting, for example, on this event, but we'll, ref we'll discuss it in a, in a few minutes. And we have to be very careful about two simplistic analogies. Human society is very complex. There are layers of the development. And that question of causality of the historical event is often extremely complex. Those are few caveats when we discuss uh, for our discussion on evolution of diplomacy and technology. Now, this year is particularly important. We will uh, have two anniversaries. The first anniversary is 200 years of the Vienna Congress, which was held between 1814 and uh, 1815 in Vienna, uh, which basically marked the end of a Napoleonic war, a Napoleonic era, and set the stage for probably the longest period in the modern history without major global war. There were Crimean War and a few other wars, wars for independence of Italy and Germany, but there was no major war till 1914. And it is considered the Vienna Congress to be one of the great successes in the history of diplomacy. And we will celebrate also 100 years of the start of the First World War, which is uh, one of the great failures in, uh, in the history of diplomacy. And I'm sure that you have already read, especially uh, our colleagues from, uh, from Serbia, because it's obvious that Serbia is in a focus when we discuss the start of the First World War. And I'm sure that you consulted uh, some books, articles, literature on this issue. And on the example of the First World War, you can see and how complex is causality identifying the causes of the main historical events. And you have all sorts of uh, explanation why it started. And if you use this analogy from uh, uh, Fernand Brodel, and we won't go to geological time, but some arguments, second level are that essentially there were German uh, and uh, interests of the other great powers, France, Russia, to extend their um, geostrategical space. But the main motivation for Germany, because Germany was late in the colonial uh, 
distribution of colonies. He tried to correct it during the Berlin Co Congress in the late 19th century, but he didn't succeed. Therefore, one of the explanations is that Germany simply needed more colonies, needed redistribution of the colonies. And it, it was difficult to do it in Africa and Asia because of the dominance of France and, uh, and the UK. It started to do through this conflict uh, in, the, in the Balkans. This one explanation, then there are quite a few explanations arguing that it was simply confusion. And as one books, uh, one of the most uh, notable books uh, in its title that indicates it was a sleepwalking into the war. Europe simply, due to the failures, misunderstandings, failure of diplomacy, sleepwalked into the, into the First World War. Therefore, there are different, different ex uh, explanations, and you can find the, the most voluminous literature in history are on the question of the start of the First World, World War and Napoleonic Wars. There are thousand books, articles written on this issue. In, uh, during our webinars and during our discussion, general deeper activities in this year, we will focus on both events, trying to understand why the Vienna Congress was so successful and why diplomacy failed at the beginning of the First World War. You'll have a special session analyzing exchange of telegraphs in late July, which was a crucial for the start of the First World War, when the telegraphs were literally crossing each other between mainly St. Petersburg in uh, uh, Russia and Berlin in Germany. And one of the points that uh, I will try to argue for is that that confusion in the use of telegraphs contributed to the outbreak of the First World War. Obviously, it will be too, too uh, uh, far, uh, it will be too extensive to, to assign the causality and to assign the reason for the start of the First World War to the misuse of telegraph, but it contributed to the overall confusion. And here we will make analogy between 1914 and 2014 with all caveats about uh, necessity to be careful about analogy. But again, we have extremely powerful technological tools, a tool internet, and we need to invest more in proper use of the internet, in the use of the internet, which won't uh, strengthen the uh, trend as Telegraph did in uh, 1914, uh, me potential misuse, miscommunication that could, could escalate into the general global conflict. Now, the history of diplomacy and technology is evolution or history of interplay between continuity and change. Continuity in the core function of diplomacy to solve the conflict in society through the use of peaceful means and change in the way how it, uh, it has been done. So that, as you will see uh, later on throughout uh, our webinar, the continuity and the main function of diplomacy is underlying throughout the history while the way how it was done, tools that were used for communication, for information gathering, uh, has been changing very, very rapidly, including our time with the, with the uh, use of the internet. Now, here, here is a, I will ask you to concentrate a bit on this uh, slide because it explains our methodological frame. On the left-hand side, you have internet. On the right-hand side, you have diplomacy. I use internet, but you can use any technology on the left-hand side, telegraph, telephone. Uh, you have a two common elements between communication technology, in this case, internet and diplomacy. They are information and communication. Therefore, internet use is used to the faster communication as telegraph was used. It was used also to, for storing information. And diplomacy, what diplomats do in their work they handle information. They gather information by using secret and public tools, by uh, exchanges, discussion, reception, and they also communicate. They communicate to their counterparts. They use communication for negotiation. They engage in public diplomacy. Therefore, two underlying elements of communication technology to the internet and diplomacy our information communication. This makes this interplay between communication technology and diplomacy particularly powerful. Therefore, whatever is changing on the level of technology impacts diplomacy. 
Now, these changes can be seen in three main areas. First, changing environment for diplomatic activities. Nowadays, if you are a diplomat posted to the United States, you are not anymore, uh, well, you can, you can go as a tourist, but you are not anymore focusing on, on Detroit, for example, as diplomats did 30 or 40 years where car industry, automobile industry was extremely powerful. And it was important to know what's going on in Detroit for the economic reasons, also the strongest lobbies. There was a lot of political money, money for political campaigns come through the Detroit. Nowadays, it is almost that city. Nowadays, diplomats have to know what's going on in Silicon Valley and Bay Area in general. They influence the policy in, the, in Washington. This is the basis of the new economic uh, stratification of the United States. The similar patterns could be applied to other societies, but the United States is the most visible and we are familiar with this, uh, this concept. Therefore, there are changes in environment of diplomatic activity. They are related to the question of concept of sovereignty, concept of power, and concept of interdependence, among others. They are related to economic geostrategy, uh, geographical traditional geostrategy. These are changes that communication technology and most recent internet uh, make on our society. And diplomats have to be aware because they act in, in, in this environment. Second uh, impact of this interplay is a new, on new topics of diplomatic agenda. Every new uh, technology brought new topics on diplomatic agenda. As a matter of fact, the first international organization which was established is nowadays International Telecommunication Union. It was established in the mid 19th century to handle the question of telecommunica uh, telegraph uh, uh, policy, how countries can exchange the telegraph messages. Because at the very beginning, there was a famous house, and if you go to Strasbourg, definitely visit it, uh, that house, it's more historical uh, site, where uh, there was a room divided into two parts uh, on the border. There was a French telegraph on the other side and German telegraph on, the, uh, on, on, uh, on one side and on the other side. Therefore, when you have a, a telegraph coming from Paris going to Berlin, it was received in Strasbourg, then moved uh, past on the paper uh, to the other side. The other side was typing and sending it from Strasbourg to Berlin. People realized very, very quickly that it is not functional. Therefore, they then created bilateral, later on the regional, and uh, ultimately global organization. But what is important for us to keep in mind that every new technology brought new topics on diplomatic agenda. And nowadays it's internet. Internet with the digital policy, internet with the different forums, internet governance forum, uh, ICANN, ITU, and other players. Therefore, that's the second impact that we will try to cover throughout our webinars. The third point, and which is usually called e diplomacy is use of new tools for diplomacy. In the past, telegraph, telephone, smoke signals, uh, carriages, and today, social media, website, Twitter diplomacy, Facebook, and other. Therefore, this will be some sort of architecture of our webinar throughout the years. On every point, we'll try to identify changes in environment, new topics on diplomatic agenda, and new tools for diplomatic activities. Now, so far we set a general scene for our webinar. We will now move to the question to prehistory and the question when did diplomacy start? What was this point uh, in the history? Unfortunately, we cannot identify them. It's, it's not realistic to, to identify, but we can recreate some trends that led uh, to uh, the start of diplomacy. Here is a famous drawing I know that you're familiar with when our papa predecessors, probably at that point in time, realized that it was better and more useful for everybody to hear the messenger, messenger than to eat him or her, I think him at that time. And it is that symbolic start of uh, diplomacy. But on more deeper level, it notice the point where the societies realize that they can, can benefit more from 
exchanges, more from negotiation and peaceful solution of conflicts. Now, what were, what were trends? How, how did they build up to that point when uh, societies uh, started negotiating? Well, the first major development was shift from uh, so uh, nomadic societies to sedentary societies. When our far predecessors realized that they can produce the food not only to, uh, to hunt around. And with that sedentary society, society started occupying first territories, made mainly in the area of the fertile crescent between uh, nowadays Egypt and nowadays Iraq or Mesopotamia. Those were the first settlements. And obviously with the, their society, they started producing with irrigation methods around the Nile, around the Euphrat and Tigris they started producing extra food. And then uh, accounting was in introduced, need to redistribute that extra food. And uh, with the time, the idea is that maybe the neighbor's uh, territory, the neighbor's land is more fertile and more useful, or their females uh, are, uh, should be conquered and, uh, and uh, moved into captivity, whatever motivation. But the war started, the conflicts between tribes and clans started, and it was probably the first, first uh, one of the first interactions. But in parallel to conflicts, we had a peaceful coexistence. That was more or less the line how we came to the point that the negotiation started. The second main development in this evolution is the emergence of language. And language has been the key tool for the communication of the modern society. And it, uh, uh, emerged somewhere between 100,000 years uh, BC and 40,000 years BC, when the so-called vocal box our, uh, is identified in our in archaeological site. That was somewhere between Neanderthal Neander and uh, Romanian, Neanderthal near Germany and Romanian in France. Those were far predecessors which were identical. At that point, humans started communicating. They started exchanging the ideas, and it was the basis for also diplomacy, for peaceful solution of the conflict. And I'm very happy that Hannah Slavik is, uh, is here. Hannah is one of uh, in the audience. Hannah is our expert in uh, language and diplomacy. And what we can see today, that more or less, there is unbroken line between that, what happened 60, 70,000, uh, uh, 80,000 years ago and today. Language is a, is a key tool for diplomacy and uh, for negotiations. And uh, it will remain the underlying structure of diplomacy. And we have a force in language and diplomacy, and we dedicate a lot of attention to, un to research analysis and the importance of language in diplomacy. Now, with that development, we had the emergence of uh, new tools. Uh, you can find the early uh, signs of the first, when I say tools, not necessarily pens or uh, literal tools, but diplomatic tools. I refer mainly to protocol, exchange of gifts, uh, privileges, and immunities. And we can find quite a few very, very early uh, materials or archaeological uh, signs of the importance of uh, privilege in the, in the immunities. For example, among uh, Australian Aborigines, and uh, we can find the elements of protocol in the ancient uh, Mesopotamia, Mesopotamian cities of Ur. And uh, there are now more and more sites clearly uh, identifying diplomacy uh, in very early stages of development of human society. That's, that's an undisputable fact and now confirmed by uh, archaeological findings. There were also rituals and ceremonies, and rituals and ceremonies are very important for diplomacy. And most of the research on prehistoric society is focusing on rituals and ceremonies. And you will find the rituals and ceremonies in the relation between different tribes and, uh, and the clans, the way how to provide face saving for uh, other tribes. Uh, the way how to exchange gifts. And uh, you will see in the material after the session, I will send you some examples of uh, that rich, rich source of the research on the prehistory and diplomacy. 
Now, while you're uh, having, uh, I don't know if you have your, uh, our calendar on your uh, table. If you don't have, please send us an email. While you're having this uh, image for the month of January, uh, you can uh, notice that uh, what these predecessors, early diplomats, did at their time, uh, we are doing today. Uh, they represented their clans and uh, their tribes as uh, we do today. Okay, today we have embassies, missions, the flags with the signs, but the function is the same. Is the question of representation of one social entity group uh, with, with the other social entity group. They negotiated, and it's clear that they try to solve the conflicts through the negotiation as we are doing today. Only a few kilometers from our office, up the hill, we had recently highly successful diplomatic negotiations on Iran nuclear uh, uh, disarmament. And it was clear that that negotiation was in a rather traditional way. Twitter wasn't in the room. They negotiated. They tried to persuade each other. They tried to understand the, the other side. And we'll come to that point, underlying point in history of uh, uh, technology and diplomacy. They had to search for compromise. And you will be hearing through this webinar, this probably is one of the underlying things, question of compromise. In our society, compromise is not considered in positive light. It is somehow a questionable method of dealing with social conflicts in many societies. Initially, I thought it was mainly in Western society, but then, then I did quite a bit of research. And even in Asian societies, uh, with somebody is, uh, Trying to make a compromise, it's already questioned and uh, considered questionable from the point of national pride, protection of territory, glorious history, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I'm sure that you can find examples in in, uh, in your society. But compromise was in prehistory, has been throughout the history, and it will be one of the core tools for solving problems in modern society. Now, our predecessor, like uh, we today, uh, had um, more or less the similar motivation. And the human brain hasn't been significantly developed over the last, uh, or the way how we look, or our cognitive capacity over the last uh, few thousand years. There was the motivation of the fear, hope, um, jealousy is, is, has existed at that time, and it exists today. Therefore, it makes a good basis to think about the underlying theme between prehistory and our time. And I highlighted three important building blocks of diplomacy. First is empathy, capacity to understand the, your interlocutor. Not necessarily sympathy, supporting his or her views, but capacity to understand the other side. And some uh, biological research show that we can find empathy or even compromise among uh, chimpanzees, uh, the Frank uh, the Delval, the Dutch bio biologist, did experiment and even argued that it is not that humans learn how to make a compromise with whatever trend revolution. It is innate into the, into, into the nature. And it is very interesting. Uh, discovery by Frank Deval, and you will receive the link with a few TED Talks, and I suggest that you follow that. This is the interesting point that empathy and compromise existed even before, before uh, uh, our time, before the human society. Therefore, empathy is extremely important, especially today, with the online communication and the some, somehow delinking of our physical presence, physical contact, uh, from our uh, communication. The second point is reciprocity. Reciprocity is a, that some sort of fine scale in which society functions. It doesn't have to be equal, but sense of reciprocity has to exist between individuals, uh, between societies and social groups. And third point, which I just mentioned, is a compromise. Compromise is a way to, uh, for solving the, the conflict. Based on empathy, understanding the other side, 
sense of fairness and reciprocity. And I think we will have to work much, much more as a society and each of us on revitalizing relevance of, of compromise, especially negative connotations that compromise has in normal society. And I would say even for ethical reasons, understanding other, others and trying to make a deal and arrangement with, which will protect also interests of others within the reasonable limits is ethically positive. Obviously, there are uh, uh, bad compromises, rotten compromises throughout the history, even criminals and terrorists can compromise. But this, this is for the, for the extreme. And those examples are often used as a way to kill the concept of compromise, as, uh, as overall concept for solving uh, conflicts in, in modern society. Now we are closing this session with a quick recap and uh, question if we can draw any lesson from the prehistory. Now let me just summarize. We started with providing the concept and the context for our webinars as a way of consulting history and trying to understand some patterns from history that could be useful for us, for our time, for dealing with the impact of the internet on modern society and possibly future development. We highlighted 1814 Vienna Congress as a great success of diplomacy, and 1914 as the start of the First World War as one of the main failures of diplomacy. What can we learn from one success and one failure we'll discuss throughout the webinars. Each phase, introduction of uh, diplomacy in ancient time, later on telegraph, printing press, will be visited through this methodology that we have outlined, discussion on changing environment, introduction of new topics, and use of new tools for diplomacy. This is the context in which we will run our lessons. And then what we did, we discussed briefly the prehistory of diplomacy, and we clearly identify language as one of the main developments as a tool for negotiations and interaction among different societies. And we also uh, uh, highlighted uh, uh, that there are clear, there is a clear evidence that diplomacy existed since very early days of uh, human society. You can find it through archeological art, uh, artifacts, we can find through existence of protocol, privileges and immunities, negotiations, and other techniques of diplomacy that we use uh, today. Therefore, the further forward uh, we look, as uh, Churchill said, the, for, uh, the further backward we look, the further forward we can see. And that is the, with this underlying tweet for our uh, series of webinars, I would like to conclude my presentation and to invite you to uh, ask uh, questions and make, uh, make uh, comments. The floor is yours. Thank you. Let me see if there is any question. Already? Something wrong with Okay, we have a first question from D. Are modern societies less transparent? Is it more difficult to see the intention of the other side? Well, do you know that one of my favorite topics is transparency because it became a part of ideology and uh, one can easily argue that the more information you have, the less you can see what's going on. And the concept of transparency, which is by default, by its nature, positive concept that should uh, bring more inclusive society has to be re revisited carefully. And I will give you three recent examples from diplomacy, the major breakthroughs in diplomacy, Myanmar talks, Kosovo talks, and Iran nuclear talks, where basically achieved through, one can say, translucent diplomacy, media, Twitter and other tools were not in the conference room. Therefore, we need careful revisiting of the question of transparency and uh, not using it just as an empty ideological statement, but a powerful, very important tool 
that should have had the same to make society more informed what's going on and to include more people in, in for example, diplomatic negotiations. Ginger question. Uh, a question from Ginger. If diplomacy and negotiations are so ubiquitous, oh, this word is always difficult for me to pronounce, all time and all society, then why is diplomacy considered an exclusive profession? Has this changed over history? Uh, Ginger, as you know, I argue that diplomacy is a tool. It is a profession. Now they limit limited to diplomats. And some one can say that the uh, part of the elite of society or exclusive profession. But diplomacy is essentially a tool. Uh, and I'm sure that if we analyze what we do during our normal day, we spend 40% of time trying to understand others, our uh, uh, relatives, uh, our family, our colleagues at the work, trying to persuade them, trying to negotiate with them, trying to make some sort of arrangement. But when you really distill the core of diplomacy, you can see that uh, we use it a lot. We use it at least 40% in the 40 of our daily, daily work. Okay, one can say this is more philosophical, but uh, on the other side, when it comes to representation, which is probably which you are referring as exclusive profession, it is also changing. We need now representation of the smaller groups, local communities, uh, civil society, uh, business interests. But the question of representation, which used to be the only channel uh, for, uh, for diplomats and diplomats, is now changing. It is less and less exclusive profession. Although I would be very careful, very careful of uh, uh, extreme, uh, let's say, popularization of diplomacy. Still, as we saw in the question of Iran talks a few months ago, we need a few capable and trained people who are ready to engage and solve the conflict, uh, which was um, threatening the Middle East and potentially the whole world. That's in a, another delicate balance between complete inclusiveness and some sort of professionalism in diplomacy. Angelique, uh, uh, Thank you, Jovan. Thank you, Angelique, for being with us. So as I understand, we have to analyze the history focusing on the way the success uh, then came about and with understanding what has changed since then. Determine how to replicate the success in a changing environment. Well, uh, Angelique, this is an extremely valid point. And my argument is the following. When we speak about history, when I did it during the, this presentation, we do it from our time. And I acquired through this school, through discussions, certain uh, intellectual way of un analyzing things. Therefore, this is not just the past, this is the present. Through the, my, I would say, even obsession on the, on the question of empathy and compromise, I'm casting certain light and I'm framing certain historical issues. This is very important to understand. That history is always about present and future. And in that context, yes, we have to see what we can use from the history. We have, I think, realistically speaking, to understand some dynamics in human society, which can help us in very delicate time where we are now moving in, where we have powerful technology, the internet, shaping our our life and with very little understanding beyond the general phrases that we can hear in the speeches uh, about the brave new world uh, pushing the frontier the sky is the limit uh, openness uh, i think we need much much more sophisticating understanding of the internet for example in order to benefit from it otherwise if we keep ourselves on these uh, phrases and mantras you are a, you have been involved in the IGF process and you know what I'm referring to. There is, an, in a way, ideology, which leaves just dropping of these two important concepts without trying to understand how they can contribute to our society. In this context, understanding, for example, the reason why the First World War started could be very, very useful. And we can see that before the First World War, we had the same period of enthusiasm of, uh, of uh, the time that the sky is the limit. And then, then we, had, we had a very brutal and shocking wake up call from 
our sleepwalking into the, into the mess. Second com uh, comment from the one, when you refer to DECOMOC, you're focusing on those appointed by governments, but is it true that nowadays, especially in the field of public diplomacy, many players are in the field are involved in representation? Exactly, that, that was my point. And I think uh, Ginger asked the question if, if it is exclusive profession. Yes, there is a government representation of Ministry of Foreign Affairs. But as you pointed, Angelique, it is becoming much more, much more than that with, with more and more players. Uh, Hannah, uh, on the question of perception of compromise, Jovan, could you tell us how you define compromise? I had discussion about this with a former ambassador who felt the compromise was, compromise was not necessary but after further discussion, I realized that by compromise, he meant giving up your main objectives. On the other hand, he accepted the one will always have to give up on some lesser objective to gain the main ones. And that in doing so, both sides might win, which to me means compromise. Uh, extremely good point. Extremely good point. Anna. Yes, this is the question that I've been uh, facing in many discussions. I usually uh, argue that uh, either both sides can win or both sides, both sides can lose equally. And usually the best compromises are those arrangements where all parties are equally unhappy with the outcome. Now, that could sound as, as, as a rhetorical point, but ultimately there is one underlying question what we are ready to compromise about. And usually religious uh, movements, uh, religions, at least on the rhetorical or uh, theological level, are not happy with the compromise. It was also a question with, uh, with the communist regime. When you have ideological mantra, when you have underlying truth, compromise is not acceptable because you cannot compromise with it. This is simply, simply, simply something about the discussion. More, I would say, liberal view is, uh, by the way, uh, while they're maintaining this uh, high standing, usually they negotiate, as Vatican does, uh, extensively and more religious movement and, and uh, communist parties all over the world, they used to do that. That's now the different question. But conceptually, it is important. More liberal view is that you can negotiate uh, in almost anything, including your life. This is your possession. And accept the elements when you can endanger the other side, fellow or your community, you can, you can compromise. You can uh, attach certain value to that, financial, uh, ethical, whatever, whatever value. Therefore, this is underlying element. Now, tactically speaking, where you're going to compromise on main points, obviously you won't. But the key is that you engage and you do not demonize the other side. You engage the other side as the side with legitimate concerns and with the legitimate, legitimate objectives, which is the question of empathy. You may not have a sympathy for that objective. You shouldn't as negotiator, but you should engage with that. Anna, have I managed to get closer to the answer? D, uh, looking, uh, uh, thank you, Angelita, I agree completely, Jovan, understand, uh, understanding is crucial. Understanding and, and empathy. D, looking at the any lesson cartoon in the prehistorical one, there are many people in the modern one, only one person, but are we really moving back towards a more gen general inclusion or narrowing towards dictatorship? Hmm. Oh, I never thought about this. Thank you, Dean. Well, uh, social conditions, definitely. And we have to make this cartoons more social, I agree. There are not enough people. Social conditions and social context is essential for understanding uh, for the diplomacy compromise. I'll tell you from my personal experience in the Balkans, the same people who lived and I grew up in that society very harmonious society, where they were okay. The conflicts were sometimes on the level of jokes and the, the fights in the, in, the, in, the, in the restaurants or in the bars. Uh, 
quite harmonious society where Croats, Poles, Muslims, Albanians lived in a relatively normal, normal context. Suddenly, over the just two or three years, that society turned one of the most, most uh, violent uh, and cruel societies on the earth. And basically, uh, the point was the social context. In one time, you, you, the narrative was, listen, guys, we were fighting in the past. Now let us develop something useful. Yes, we are different with this, but let us make some compromise, the reasonable life. And we had, we were fortunate to have a dictator, I put it in inverted commas, who was uh, quite hedonistic, he enjoyed life, Josip Broz Tito, and he didn't want to make us happy like Stalin or, 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 uh, or Potts or, <clears throat> or other communist leaders. And then you had in the 90s, somebody said, oh, this was artificial peace. We are supposed to fight. You are supposed to hate the Croat if you're Serb. You Croat, you're supposed to hate the Serb. And suddenly social context changed. And people thought that it was natural to hate each other and to get the guns and to kill your individual. Therefore, I strongly believe that social context is extremely important. And it can bring the best from human nature, which is, uh, let's say, Jean-Jacques Rousseau view that we are good and society can promote, but can then bring the worst, which is more Thomas Hobbes, English philosopher view that we are by nature bad, that we are driven by bad instincts to conquer, to kill others. And according to Hobbesian view, the state exists to protect us from each other, from anarchy. But I think social context is important. Well, let me close this argument with the important, importance for our time. Now, social context is so easily recreated through social media and general media. You can paint the society in this way and that way. And this is enormous power and enormous responsibility on leaders of society. And anyone who is shaping the social spirit to be aware of that power because one can shape the society and unfortunately in one way or the other way. And unfortunately there are more and more examples, for example, in the Balkans, that social media is more used for the hate speech, for painting this uh, view, concretely speaking that, what can you expect that we should fight each other? Serbs and Croats should fight each other. Everything else is fake. We're just waiting for the next war. This is extremely important that leaders opinion leaders, people involved in all, this, all of us, try to uh, understand, first of all, this power of media and try to, as much as we can, change or reshape this trend towards using of social media for, uh, for development of hate speech and that paradigm which leads towards war and not towards empathy, reciprocity and conflict. Anna, yes, thanks, Johan. That comes back to importance of understanding the people on the other side of the table. Anna, we will have to dig a bit more into this question. It is extremely important question, both on the philosophical level. Unfortunately, philosophers, for very strange reason for me, haven't been focusing on compromise and empathy, but also on very practical level, how to convey this message, how to discuss it with our students, how to discuss it with the diplomats or to have better understanding of that element of empathy and compassion. Thank you, Dee, as well. Uh, uh, Ginger, yes, Ginger is bringing discussion back to, to uh, internet governance. I don't know how is, uh, how represented the internet governance crowd is in this uh, webinar. But one of the issues, yes, Ginger, internet governance crowd needs much more empathy. It should avoid delegitimization of the players on both sides. On the one side, the government arguing that uh, civil societies, all civil societies just manipulated some governments, obviously, and represent the business interest and they are not legitimate. On, and on the other side, that all governments are just corrupted and uh, just dream how to control and to introduce dictatorship. It is simply not the truth. There are different governments, there are different motivations within the same government, and that there are many, many different uh, uh, players among in non-governmental sector with, again, different motivations. Google is trying to go do so many good things, 
to us. And I'm so thankful, for example, for Translate to Google. I'm, as you know, I'm very, very weak with languages. And Google is, 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 is a great help. But in the same time, Google is a company with business interest, with the need to increase share, with the need to protect their uh, business environment. But even with one very specific player, you can see different motivations and different contributions to society. If we need first empathy, we need in internet governance to understand, to open our ears, the radars to the other side and to try to engage, and then to find some sort of reasonable compromise, which will both be legitimate and also uh, leave the open future development of the internet, not not to close it in whatever governmental business uh, procrastinate bed. Good, thank you very much. Uh, uh, unfortunately, I cannot hear you. Uh, I can uh, just, based on the question, guess that uh, it triggers some reflections and uh, thinking about the overall issue of the diplomacy and the technology. And the question of uh, some broader questions on like a compromise, empathy, and their relevance for our time. And uh, Ginger's last comment was very, very appropriate of linking it to internet governance or digital policy negotiation. Many thanks from Geneva. Uh, we will be seeing each other next month during the webinar on the last Tuesday of the month at the same time. And uh, yeah, we will again play between past, present, and future. All the best. Bye-bye.